that distraction. <clears throat> no disrespect uh, meant, okay? And we'll see if I'm rubbing against my shirt and driving everybody crazy. Okay, so you may want to do it in other courses or something with complex matrices. That's at the end. It's not on any exam. If we understand the real case, we're super, super happy. Tiny bit of vocabulary. 
A matrix is rectangular um, diagonal if everything off the diagonal is zero. So here's a diagonal until I run out of space, okay? Everything else is zero. Here's the diagonal. Everything off of it is zero. So that's what the definition here says. Any ij entry where i and j are different has to be zero. It's called a rectangular diagonal matrix. Okay, so they look like a diagonal matrix with columns of zeros or a diagonal matrix with additional rows of zeros. That's what you have for a rectangular diagonal matrix. And then the, the diagonal is you start in the upper corner and you go with this 45 degrees and you just take those entries. So the diagonal here is 3, 4, minus 1, and the diagonal here is 1 and minus 6. Okay, so small, small, small generalization of a diagonal matrix. <clears throat> and so the SVD theorem says every real matrix can be factored as an orthogonal matrix times a rectangular diagonal matrix times another orthogonal matrix, and we put its transpose there typically, though if V is orthogonal, V transpose is also orthogonal, so it doesn't really matter, but that's how it's always written. And then these numbers will turn out to be really important to us. The elements on the diagonal of sigma, and once again, A doesn't have to be square, and sigma this rectangular diagonal matrix, it has the same size as A. Okay, all the entries here are non-negative, and we order them such that they are decreasing. Okay? Um, the columns of U, we're going to construct it in a special case, are the eigenvectors of A times A transpose, and the columns of V are eigenvectors of A transpose and A. And if you square these things called the singular values, they are eigenvalues of A times A transpose and A transpose times A. So all of this will pop out when we look at the proof. Um, Okay, so it's very special structure. Now, A times A transpose, so that's a symmetric matrix. Every symmetric matrix can be diagonalized with an orthonormal transformation. Okay, so how we get the columns of U <coughs> is going to be from the eigenvectors of A times A transpose, as we'll see, and similarly the columns of V. So A times A transpose and A transpose times A, they're both symmetric matrices and they're both positive semi-definite, okay? Positive semi-definite. The smallest eigenvalue is greater than or equal to zero. So if we take the square roots of them, that's what these guys will be, they all make sense. You're not taking the square root of a negative number. Okay. So. okay, so once we have this, we'll then go through and look at the numerical interpretation if you look through the handout. Um, but that's what's going on. So these guys, the sigmas are called the singular values of A. So let's do the proof. Proof. So I'm going to assume A is square, 
just to keep the notation as simple and clean as possible, and full rank. So A transpose times A will be positive definite. Okay, the so general proof is given uh, later in the handout. It's just a little bit of extra bookkeeping to do when you have um, A not being square and A transpose A being only positive semi-definite. Okay, you don't want to write down something and divide by zero. You got to do a little bit of extra bookkeeping for that. So we'll do this case. Okay, so if A transpose A is positive definite, it's a symmetric positive definite matrix, we can choose an orthonormal basis for its eigenvectors. So, let u1, u2, um be an orthonormal Uh, set of eigenvectors of A transpose A satisfying the following. Okay, so these guys are eigenvectors. So if I take A transpose A times UI, I get lambda I times UI, okay? They're eigenvectors, so lambda I are eigenvalues. And so I'm gonna assume that I've ordered them such that the first eigenvalue is the biggest, the second one is the second biggest, or it could be equal to the first one. They don't have to be distinct, etc. Okay, everybody agree that that's always possible, that I can order them that way? I mean, if lambda four is the biggest one, just reorder the lambdas and then relabel the u's, okay? So that's always without loss of generality, okay? So W, L, O, G, so without loss of generality, okay? So symmetric matrices always have a full set of orthonormal eigenvectors. Okay, so I'm gonna use the U's to form this orthogonal matrix. I'll stack them up as the columns and I'll make an orthogonal matrix. Okay, I'm gonna first make a guess at what the V's should be. I know the theorem tells us what they should be, but let's just do the following. Let's define the VIs to be A transpose times UI. And let's check if those vectors are orthonormal. Okay, I want to build another orthogonal matrix. So I check the inner product of these vectors. Excuse me? VI yeah. is A transpose times UI. This is VI inner product VJ. I'll say, no, my handwriting is so bad, but I've, I guess I've arrogantly assumed you've gotten used to reading terrible handwriting. I apologize. <laughs> Let me see if I can make that a little bit more clear. Uh, 
Any better? Mm, not really, but it's okay. So that would be VI transpose times VJ. And so VI transpose is UI transpose A. And then VJ is A transpose UJ. This guy is an eigenvector of A times A transpose with eigenvalue lambda J. So this equals UI transpose times um, lambda J times UJ. Okay. And so that equals lambda j if i equals j and zero if i is not equal to j. Okay, so these, these new vectors I've defined are orthogonal, but they're not necessarily orthonormal unless all of my eigenvalues are equal to one. Okay, so inner product of VI and VJ is zero when I is different from J. And that's because the UIs and the UJs are um, orthogonal. And then this inner product is one when I equals J and that gets me the eigenvalue. So it's not quite orthonormal. What do I need to do to the vectors VI to make them orthonormal? Normalize them. Well, that's a good answer. <laughs> yeah, so this is what we're going to do. Just relabel. VI equals 1 over square root lambda I A transpose UI. And so then when I do VI transpose VI, I'll get lambda I divided by lambda I and I get one. So these are now orthonormal. Okay, so then this set VM, right? A was M by M, yes. <clears throat> is ortho normal. Okay, so I started out with H um, with A times A transpose. I used the eigenvectors to build an orthonormal basis. And now from that with a simple operation, we can check those parts. We check that those vectors are now um, orthonormal. So I can define a matrix V I can define a matrix U And my V's and my U's are suspiciously similar. <clears throat> and a matrix sigma where these guys are the square roots of the eigenvalues. So I'm just going to define those. Hang with me, guy. Thanks. Oh, come on.
Okay, so we use the eigenvectors of A times A transpose created to get an orthonormal basis. So this matrix is now orthogonal. I have another orthonormal set of eigenvectors I constructed from these. That matrix is orthogonal. These guys are ordered sigma 1 greater than or equal to sigma 2 greater than or equal to sigma m. And then we can see why I wanted my A transpose times A to be um, positive definite because I didn't want to be dividing by 0 when I did this step here, okay? So otherwise, I have to do the special case. When the eigenvalue is 0, I do something else, okay? So that's taken care of in the other proof. Now, is it true that if I multiply all these things together, I get A back? Well, let's just check. So let's do A times V. So it's A times V1, A times V2, A times Vm. Plug in for the V's, A transpose UI times divided by the square root. So I get A, A transpose U1, U1, square root lambda 1. A times A transpose U2, square root lambda 2. A times A transpose UM over square root of lambda M. The UIs are eigenvectors of A times A transpose, so this is going to be lambda 1 times U1 and then lambda 1 times u1 divided by square root of lambda 1 is square root of lambda 1 times u1, okay? So this is square root lambda 1 times u1. Square root of lambda 2 times u2 square root lambda m times um. Okay, so we just substituted in that the ui's were constructed as eigenvectors of a times a transpose. And the eigenvalues were lambda i, and lambda i divided by square root of lambda i is square root of lambda i. Okay. So, this times square root of lambda 1, square root of lambda 2, square root lambda m, And so this is u, and this is sigma. Okay, so you can go home and check. This matrix is either this one or it's the opposite. Okay, so go home and check. Make sure it's, you've got them on the right side. And so we have AV. is u times sigma, v is an orthogonal matrix, so a equals u sigma v transpose. Check. Then, 
let you check this at home. Check that A transpose A times VI equals lambda I times VI, okay? In other words, these vectors VI that we constructed from the eigenvectors of A times A transpose really are eigenvectors of A transpose A. So that was the second part of the theorem. Okay, so we built on our knowledge of symmetric matrices, made a guess at some other vectors that could be really cleverly useful. They weren't quite right the first time. They were orthogonal but not orthonormal. We normalized them built the vectors, the matrices V, U, sigma, did A times V and got U times sigma, so A equals U sigma V transpose, as promised. Okay, so back to the theorem. Every real matrix, we did the square case, can be written as an orthogonal matrix, rectangular, diagonal, orthogonal matrix. We can order these in decreasing order. The smallest one is greater than or equal to zero in general. And you build U from the eigenvectors of A times A transpose. You can build V from the eigenvectors of A transpose and A, or you can build the Vs from taking the eigenvectors of U and doing a simple multiplication by A and normalizing them. So your, your call. Okay, so that's the, that's the factorization. Let's see why it's useful. And that's the main message. Okay, so we go to MATLAB and do SVD. Psi, it's unable to print a sigma, so they call it S, okay. Question. These three vectors, are they linearly independent? So is the rank of that matrix three, two, one, zero? It's not four, because there's only three columns, okay? Well, it's not zero either, because there's at least one non-zero. So we do the SVD, U, fine, okay? You can check, it's <clears throat> orthonormal. This is what we care about, the singular values, okay? So this one is roughly three, this is roughly one, this is roughly zero, very close, okay? So the point is, when the largest to the smallest singular value has a huge range, then you start throwing these things away, and we would say that this matrix has numerical rank Two. Okay? You might treat this as coming from noise in the data, is the idea. Okay? So, yes, it is the singular value decomposition because when I multiply u times sigma times v transpose, then I get things that are 10 to the minus 15. So I'm at machine uh, epsilon essentially. So the theorem is the exact rank of A is the number of non-zero singular values. And then we define the numerical rank of A as, and this depends on us to decide what is the given threshold, but we usually do it as like a percentage of the largest singular value. So maybe after 1% of the largest singular value, we just stop and say, those are zero. And so once again, for you, if you're doing 1% of this, then a point uh, two, you, so this is definitely zero, okay? If you want to do 0.1%, this should be 0.2. 
uh, 0.02, okay? It's still zero. So it's up to you to declare for your problem what is the amount, uh, what is the standard deviation of the noise? You say, ah, that's probably just noise coming in. And one of these columns is really a linear combination of the other two plus a little bitty tiny perturbation. Okay. So that's where the SVD comes in. Does that make sense? Okay, so it's a, it's a very, very common uh, tool. Sometimes you'll see it called PCA, Principal Components Analysis, but it's exactly the same thing. Okay, so here's a five by five matrix. We do the SVD, we say, eh, I don't care about U, eh, I don't care about V, all I wanna see is what are the um, singular values. Once again, I mean, 1% of this would be roughly one. And so this, is this below your threshold? And you say the rank of the matrix is numerically four? Or is this big enough? You say, eh, I'm gonna keep it, it's still fine, it's numerically. It is absolutely the rank is five, theoretically, okay? But numerically you might call that four. Okay, so let me make that um, concept a little bit more clear. So this is, okay, so this last part. Okay, so this you want to know, and this you want to know. Of course, this, this theorem you want to know. And this is super useful. Okay, when you multiply out U sigma V transpose, you know, hey, it's just matrices. Everybody in this class, including me, should be able to do this, okay? But this is what you get. You get the first singular value times U1, V1 transpose. U1, the first column of U, V1, the first column of V, plus sigma second singular value times U2, V2 transpose, etc. So if A is M by N, each of these terms here is M by N. So where does that come from? And then we'll talk about a little bit more physically what it means. Okay, I don't think this one was on homework one. Too bad. Okay, should have been. Write A in terms of its columns and write B in terms of its rows. So here's B transpose and that's the columns of B. Fact, A times B is the sum over the number of columns of A times the columns, first column of A times the first row of B, second column of A times the second row of B, et cetera. Okay, so just, just go home and work that out. A1, AN times B1, BN, okay? And I give you the hints about how to do it. You know the formulas for getting the IJ entry of when you multiply two matrices. Well, this is a matrix, it's just a column. This is a matrix, it is just a row. You can calculate the IJ entry and compare it to what is the IJ entry of AB and that you did calculate in homework one. Okay, so you can use homework one to prove this. And then there's a ton of other little simple exercises I highly recommend. But here's what we get. 
U1 times V1, that's M by N, and we will see shortly that this matrix, we're going to define a norm on matrices. This matrix has norm 1, this matrix has norm 1, this matrix has norm 1. Okay? They're all size 1 because they're built out of orthonormal vectors. Furthermore, when you take a column vector times a row vector and you make a matrix, and if these things are non-zero, the rank of this matrix is 1, the rank of this matrix is 1, the rank of this matrix is 1. Now look, each of these things are rank 1 and they have um, norm 1. The scale is the singular value. So A, we have P non-zero singular values, let's say. Okay, so it has full either column or row rank, or maybe some of the P's are zero in which case, but we can see how is the rank of A getting built up? It's the largest singular value times this rank one, this singular value times rank one. We're now rank two as long as sigma two is not equal to zero. Then we get rank three, and then we get rank five, and then maybe this is zero, and so we stopped at five. So we, each time we're adding a rank, and this is how much we're scaling it by. Maybe this is 100, maybe that was 30, maybe that was 20, maybe this is 10 to the minus 4, something like that, okay? So suppose, suppose I wanted to make the rank of A drop. What do I mean by that? Go back to this guy. Suppose I want to make the rank of A drop. Well, I would set this equal to zero and form the corresponding matrix. Then it would have rank one, two, three, four. Okay? What perturbation am I really adding to A to make the rank drop, well, it's this. I'm just adding minus this term, and then this, this goes away, and the rank is the rest, what's left, the big terms. Okay? So we're going to use this idea, but this really helps you understand how you are building up the linearly independent columns in your matrix. It's this expansion from the singular vectors of A, the left and right singular vectors of A, and the singular values that scale them. Rank one, rank two, when I add this, rank three, when I add the next one, I said all the rest of them were zero, then I stop at rank three. And all of that is just done from knowing A times B is this formula, and then there's some other little exercises that will make a lot of sense after we cover the rest of this. Okay? So I'm going to define a norm on matrices that's different than any norm we've defined so far. But it's still a norm. Okay, so this is going back to homework two, where we looked at the max and min of X transpose MX, where M was a real symmetric matrix, okay? And we did it over the Euclidean norm of the vector being one. And we found the max was the largest eigenvalue of M. And just to remind ourselves, when we did the min, it was the smallest eigenvalue of M. Okay, so we have this bound on X transpose MX. And so the induced norm on a matrix, when we're putting the Euclidean norm on the domain and the range, so here's the domain, that's the Euclidean norm squared equals 1. I'm going to put the Euclidean norm on AX as well. So the Euclidean norm is the square root then of this vector transpose times itself. 
Okay. And A transpose A is symmetric. And when I maximize that over X transpose equals one, I get the maximum eigenvalue of A transpose A. Okay, so that's called the induced norm. This is the maximum amplification that X undergoes when multiplied by A, searching over all possible X's of length one. Okay, so it's the amplification. And the biggest one is the largest eigenvalue of A transpose A square root. Okay, so that's a norm. It's a little bit of work to go through and show it satisfies triangle inequality and all of that. It's called the induced norm, so it must be a norm. It's called one, okay? But you really should actually check it, okay? Now, let me go back to the exercises just one second. And so I have you look at A transpose times A, okay? And you're looking at VI, VI transpose. What I show, have you show is that this matrix, it's, has, its largest eigenvalue is one. In fact, it has one eigenvalue that's one and the rest of them are zero. And it's a really simple multiplication to check that because this matrix times VJ is VI times VI transpose times VJ and VI transpose times VJ is zero when I is different than J and one when I equals J. So I get one times VI when J equals VI. So VI is an eigenvector and its eigenvalue is one. Okay, and then there's all the other eigenvalues. So, okay, so that's what the exercise sets you up to understand is that each of the terms in this expansion, this has induced matrix norm one, induced matrix norm one, induced matrix norm one, and these are the scaling factors now in front. So this would have induced matrix norm sigma one. It's big. induced matrix norm sigma two. So these are descending contributions to the rank of A, which is kind of awesome. And so now we can understand the distance of a singular matrix, a matrix from being singular. So suppose our matrix has exact theoretical rank R. So sigma R is the smallest non-zero sigma uh, singular value because if it, the rank was R plus one, then sigma R plus one would be non-zero. So it's the smallest non-zero matrix. And so the theorem you get is that if E is any N by M matrix, whose induced matrix norm is smaller than the singular value, then it cannot make the rank of your matrix fall. There always exists a perturbation matrix. This is a perturbation that has size exactly equal to the smallest singular value that causes the rank to fall. And in fact, Here's the perturbation, minus the smallest singular value times UR VR transpose. And it follows from that expansion. And so this is the matrix of smallest norm. Its norm is sigma R that causes the rank of A to reduce. And if I wanted to make the rank of A fall twice, I cancel the last two terms in the expansion. If I want to make the rank of A fall three times, I would just cancel the last three terms in the expansion, okay? So, the idea is you now have a tool that tells you how far a matrix is from being singular. You know, you start out with A invertible. Is it robustly invertible? 
I know if it's robustly invertible or not by looking at the smallest singular value. How tiny of a perturbation, think about it as noise in your measurement, can I add to the matrix to make the rank fall? So that's kind of incredible, and we don't see that very clearly from the QR factorization. So that's what the SVD does for us. Okay, so this expansion here is telling you how the rank of your matrix, the various contributions that are coming to it. So that's what you get from the columns of U and the columns of V. As you build up, here's, here's rank one, here's rank two, here's rank three, here's rank P. I can make it rank P minus one by canceling this term. Whew. That's a lot. But it's, in some sense, super easy. It's just symmetric matrices, and we've done that. But um, a whole bunch follows from knowing about eigenvectors of symmetric matrices, orthonormal bases, orthogonal matrices. So that's what it all comes down to. Questions? Awesome. Very useful to know. Okay, so. Um, so this shows up as kind of true-false, multiple choice on many exams. So you'll look at the practice exams and those facts will be there, okay? So what, what, I, what you will do in your next homework is you will be given an image. It's a zebra, in fact, okay? Black and white. And I'll show you how to, in the homework set, how to convert the grayscale tones of that into a matrix, okay? You'll calculate its SVD, and then you'll throw away a whole bunch of all of the, what you think are low rank terms in the SVD. So this will be like a thousand, okay? P will be like a thousand. And you'll see if when you reconstruct the image by using just the first 15 terms in the expansion, is it still a zebra? Or does it become a mouse, okay? Or you can't even recognize what it is. That's image compression, guys, okay? That's JPEG, essentially. That's JPEG, okay? Take the image, convert it into a matrix, do SVD, throw away terms, collapse it back down, okay? So how do I throw away and then have less information to store? is I get rid of all of the terms in the matrix that correspond to small singular values. So, you know, when it's five by five, it's not very impressive. But when it's a thousand by a thousand matrix, it's very impressive, okay, to only keep 17 columns of the, of the matrix and then reconstruct it from that, okay? So that's, that's, that's what you'll play with. Now guess how hard it is for me to have you do that on the final exam. <laughs> Zebras are hard to do on the final exam because you, you need a thousand by thousand matrix and so we can't do that. And so the questions on the final exam are much less interesting. They're tedious things like this, okay? But, so, but this is how to decompose data and then reconstruct it and decide how many terms to have in it. So that's, that's practical. Okay, if it is, then we didn't talk about it, okay? I completely deny that the, even though it's on film, it doesn't matter if I say it didn't happen, it didn't happen. That's their current uh, political climate now, don't you think? Yeah. Okay, so that's SVD. Anything else you want to know about SVD? No, neither do I, okay? There's some other stuff, but it's not on any Rob 501 exam, okay? So it's useful things. Uh, the general proof for when you have uh, matrices that are non-square, 
and then the stuff for complex matrices. It's all there in some future life when you need more information about SVDs. It's all there. Ta-da! Okay. Well, if you don't have questions, we're going to start real analysis. You ready for that? Okay. Okay, part two, real analysis. So we're going to understand the topology of norm spaces, open sets and closed sets. And then we'll do continuous functions. We'll understand um, the contraction mapping theorem. So how do you prove algorithms um, actually can uh, asymptotically compute something? Okay. And so that'll mean we'll have to understand what is a sequence and when does it converge, which sounds pretty nice. Okay, so we'll say a sequence converges if I know to a certain value, if I know that value and all the terms eventually get really close and stay there, okay? And then I'll ask you to prove that your algorithm converges and you'll go, but I don't know what the limit is, okay? That's what I'm trying to actually compute with my algorithm and so I can't check the definition of convergence because I don't have the limit in my hand, okay? And then we'll deal with that. So there'll be a notion called Cauchy's, Cauchy sequences where you don't have to know about the limit and you can still deduce properties. So that'll be kind of amazing, super practical. And then we'll give some ways that we can, that these Cauchy sequences appear in engineering problems and things like that, so. Stunned silence or just still the you don't like me treatment? Okay, okay, let's see. Okay, so this is going to be, I think, pretty cool. So, so let's let X, R, be a normed space. Okay, do we recall what all that stuff means? This is a set of vectors. These are our, is the field. And this is how we measure length. And it satisfies the norm of every vector is non-negative. The norm of a vector is zero if and only if the vector is zero. The triangle inequality is satisfied. And the norm of alpha x is absolute value of alpha times the norm of x. Okay, so that's a norm space. From now on, we're going to take R equals to, we're going to take the field equals to R. Come on. You don't have to, but we're going to do this. We will all, not also, always. Assume the field equals R, we will simply write X and the norm, okay? So the field is just assumed to be the real numbers when we do this. That's all. Just making the notation slightly, slightly um, easier. I think we're pretty good with that. We've made some definitions before. If we have two points in our vector space, hey, go away. The distance from x to y was the norm of x minus y. OK. 
Okay, so that's called the distance of x from y, or the distance between x and y. And if we have x in x and s, a subset of x, the distance from x to s was by definition the infimum over y and s of the distance from x to y. And using our definition above, okay, so S subset. Doesn't have to be a subspace. Okay. So we're going to build up the notions of open sets and closed sets on the basis of the notion of distance. Distance between two points and the distance from a point to a subset. Okay. This seems okay. We've, we've seen this before. If I had have asked you if you knew the right and write down the definition, you would have denied uh, fully, but since I've reminded you, you're good, right? Yeah, yeah. Hey. Okay. Um, remark. Get set. No. Just a quick remark. Okay, so what does it mean if the distance between x and a set is zero? x is distance zero from s. So let's, what I'm asking you is to recall, what does it mean that this infimum is zero? Does that mean that there's necessarily a point y in S that equals x? If it were equal, that would be a minimum then, right? Yeah, okay. So, there may not be one that's exactly equal to zero, but it means for every epsilon positive, there exists a y in S with the norm of x minus y less than epsilon, okay? That's what it means for the infimum to be zero. I can approximate x arbitrarily closely by elements of S. This is my approximation error. I can find an element in S that is within that approximation error. So that's distance being zero. Okay. That's easy enough. What is the distance being not zero. What does that mean? See, I'm just getting you warmed up on your um, definitions of infimum, and now I want you to negate this statement. So if the distance from x to s is positive, what does that mean? First row, okay? What happens when I negate a for every? Exist, okay? So there exist epsilon positive. Second row, what happens to the rest of the statement? When I have an exist, it becomes for L, okay? Then. There's some epsilon positive such that no matter what y and s I choose, what does that 
satisfy. Third row. What's the next? There exists a Y and S that fails this condition. Third row, you guys all get C minuses today, okay? So it fails this condition, so that's negative. So that's norm X minus Y greater than or equal to epsilon, okay? If the distance from a point to an S is positive, then for some epsilon, could be very small, but it's non-zero, no matter what element I choose, my approximation error is always greater than or equal to epsilon, okay? Cool. Cool, okay. Open, set. And close sets. Okay, so these things, I hope you'll have the, these two um, things committed to memory. What does it mean for the distance to be zero and the distance to be positive? I need those committed to memory, okay? Because everything we do with open sets and closed sets is going to come down to the distance between objects, and it's typically points and a very specific set, or it's complement. Ooh. Okay, so definition, whoops. Definition. Let x0 be a point in our vector space. And let a be a non-negative, non, a positive, excuse me, a positive real number. Then the open ball of radius A about the point X0 is B sub A of X0 is the set of all other points in X such that the norm of X minus A, X zero minus A, X, oh, X minus X zero is less than A, okay? So, strictly less, okay? That's super important. This is open ball of radius A about X zero. Okay, so the picture in your mind, right, is you take your X zero and you just draw a ball, right? That's the picture everybody has in their mind. Good, let's do some examples. Okay. Examples, so let's do R2 and I'll attempt to draw these with the two norm. Okay, and I'm going to draw in each case the ball of radius one about the origin. Oh, it's already starting out bad. Yeah, it's not too bad. Okay, and does not include. 
include <coughs> the boundary. Okay, so it's everything inside through the distance has to be strictly less than one. So that's radius one. Everybody, no surprise is there, right? It's a circle. The surprise is how bad my circle is. No, no, we're not surprised by that anymore either. Okay, good. What does the one norm look like? I heard somebody say the answer. Okay. So all the points of distance one and the one norm, that is distance one, that is distance one, okay? You add this point and that point, you get a half and a half, you get one, you get a diamond, okay? So that's the one norm. What if you use the max norm? What do you get? Ah, okay. <coughs> yep, every point on that line is length one, that line, that line, that line, yep, okay. Anyway, does that look like your common definition of a ball? No. Does that look like the ball you want to play with either? No. Okay. But we don't call them unit um, diamonds. We don't call them unit squares. We don't call them anything. This is called the unit ball in, this, in the two norm. This is the unit ball in the one norm. And this is the unit ball in the um, infinity norm. Why did I put a one there? That's it. Oh, it is the ball of radius one, okay? That's why I put it there. Okay, so those are all unit balls, and that should be not a rectangle, but a square. Life is hard, okay? So those are unit balls, and they're open because we do not include the points that have length one. Everybody's pretty good with this? Yes. Yes, it's very simple. How could you doubt us, okay? Now, in infinite dimensional spaces, I have a little bit harder problem than this even with the drawing, right? So we're going to stop here at, at two. But we can do norms on infinite dimensional spaces, okay? We can take all of the monomials and put the um, two norm on where we use the integral of the function squared over AB, et cetera. Okay, now I need another little simple picture. Suppose a set B is contained in a set A. What is the relation of B when I intersect it with the complement of A? What is that equal to? B is inside of A. So it's the empty set, okay? So what if B is contained in the complement of A? The complement of the complement is the original set, okay? So what does that equal? Also the empty set, okay? Now, can you do this mental gymnastics? Okay. If I say B intersected with A is the empty set, then B is contained in the complement of A. 
This, I need you guys to be able to do this. So this is important. Okay. This is important. It's, it's super simple. Draw the picture. Okay. It's super simple. Just like I need you to be able to do this as well. Okay. All of our definitions of open sets and closed sets, they come down to this this mental gymnastics. The distance is zero no matter how small my approximation error I'm allowed to have. As long as it's positive, I can find an approximate satisfying that. And if the distance is positive, I can always find an approximation error that I can never meet, okay? Every element that I'm allowed to use from my approximation exceeds that given bound. One set is contained in another if the intersection with the complement is empty. I think that direction everybody is easy with. It's this one that is harder to do the mental gymnastics on, okay? So we, we need that. Okay. So, so now let's go back to our distance. Okay, so we have x in x and s contained in x, a subset. Okay, so as we just said, distance from x to s equals zero if and only if for every epsilon greater than zero, there exists a y in s, norm x minus y strictly less than epsilon. Oops. Oh, come on. What did I do? Hmm. I think it's just this one. Nope. This one. There we go. That got hit accidentally. There we go. If and only if for every epsilon greater than zero. If I take the ball of radius epsilon about x and I intersect it with s, what do I have to get? Every epsilon greater than zero, there's a y in s that is within the ball of radius epsilon about x, right? This y is inside of here. So this intersection is <coughs> non-empty, OK? That means there's something in s whose distance from x is less than epsilon. There's something in s whose distance from x is less than epsilon. Okay? They mean the same thing, but they look very different when you first practice this stuff. Okay? Then B, and this is where we'll stop for today, distance from X to S is positive. <coughs> and what I want to do is negate this second condition, okay? We've already negated the previous one. Let's negate this condition. The distance is positive if and only if. Fourth row, what do I do here? <laughs> there exists an epsilon positive 
such that the intersection with S is equal to, what does I have to put here now? There exists an epsilon so that the intersection is fifth row. One, two, three, four, five, yes. It's is empty. Okay. Drop the mic on that one. Okay. That was too exciting. Okay. So that's if and only if there exists epsilon greater than zero such that the ball of radius epsilon about x is contained in what? The complement of S. Bravo! Okay. These relationships, if, if you guys have these down for Tuesday when we start, everything becomes super, super easy. Okay? Here's A, here's B, this is complement of A. B contained in A, if and only if B intersected complement of A equals empty set. Okay? So the complement, okay, so. This is what we need, so distance x to s is positive means here's s, here's x, and I can put a ball of radius epsilon, because this is, all of this is the complement of s. I can bound x away from the set s. So we'll do examples and stuff on Tuesday. I'll remind you of these concepts, but um, uh, this is this is go this is pure gold. These two geometric statements, which on the surface, I mean, they're patently trivial, but it's so easy to get mixed up with this stuff, okay? But think A, B, B contained in A, so B cannot contain anything in the, the complement of A, so its intersection is the empty set. These relationships on distance will give us everything about open sets, closed sets, so if this part is easy, then the topology of norm spaces is trivial to you. And if these statements are murky, then when we do open sets and closed sets, it's all going to seem hard. Okay? So work on that a little bit. We've got class Tuesday. And then for all the international students, what is Thursday? It's the turkey eating day. Yes. And so there's no class on Thursday. What's Friday? Black Friday. Black Friday. <laughs> exactly. So there's no class on Black Friday either, okay? Now what is Monday? Cyber Monday, but we, we do have, well, we don't have class on Monday, but you do, you, do, you do have class in Rob 550 on Monday, okay? So Cyber Monday, you still have to come to class, okay? So, yeah. So please, please, please look at this stuff a little bit before Tuesday. And it is all going to be really easy. And if you don't look at that, Tuesday is going to seem like mumbo jumbo. More mumbo jumbo than normal is what I mean. Thank you.